Control Committee for Climate Change, where all ministries of agriculture, energy, environment, among others, sit down at a table and start discussing what to do about climate change. Each, uh, this this uh, interministerial committee has uh, several uh, working groups on adaptation, on mitigation, on international affairs, and obviously on uh, green uh, house uh, gases. And um, obviously, Panam participates in, this, in these working groups. And you are discussing and talking with, obviously, agriculture and uh, livestock and other ministers. In 2007, two years after that decree of that uh, commission, uh, Mexico launches its uh, national climate change strategy uh, to orient the, uh, the efforts of these uh, ministries in order to tackle climate change. And in 2009, two years afterwards, a special program uh, was decreed by the president with goals, particular goals of the ministries in order to either mitigate or adapt, or adapt to climate change. In that uh, year, Bernard starts uh, its policy in climate change, 2009, and it is until 2010 that Bernard uh, has its own climate change uh, strategy for protected areas. Uh, as Julia uh, mentioned before, the, the climate change strategies uh, for protected areas in Mexico has uh, six different components, two components, the substantial components, obviously, adaptation and mitigation ones, uh, three different uh, cross cutting components, which is knowledge, uh, cultural communication, and obviously development, uh, capacity development, and technical assistance. And there's a sixth and very important component, which is obviously public policy and transversality within other, other sectors. And obviously, the strategy brings about many new uh, or old uh, concepts like landscape planning, connectivity between protected areas. A, a decree of areas with high potential for capture and storage uh, carbon, and starting uh, the new phase of management effectiveness, not only within areas but outside borders in the transition areas, due to the fact that most of the threats in Mexico areas come from outside our borders. Afterwards, once we had the, the national strategy for climate change, we decided to go a, a step further and identify uh, the need of that uh, landscape, seascape planning through what we call adaptation programs in place of climate change. And uh, for those uh, Spanish-speaking uh, people, we put some uh, guidelines that we put in Mexico on how to uh, do an adaptation program. It's uh, obviously uh, based on many literature that you know, and it takes you step by step on how to elaborate that adaptation program. Uh, so what we do in Mexico is we identify, as I said, the, the unit, the spatial unit that produces criteria and its transition areas around it. We do the adaptation program, and then we take uh, the, the main adaptation strategies and look for funding to implement those strategies on the field. Obviously, in some very complicated cases, uh, what we look is uh, to have participatory process with local communities and stakeholders in the elaboration of adaptation problems. That's very important. And each strategy, as shown in the slide, has a, 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 a logic framework on how to tackle that. This is the case of uh, biosphere reserve in Tulum for Chiapas, Mexico, where we have uh, cow forests, etc., and other species. And there's a very important uh, production of coffee, uh, certified coffee in that biosphere itself in the transition areas. But now, with climate change, uh, coffee growers are going up the hill because they need, obviously, special conditions for, for temperature for those, for those plantations. And obviously, the chromosomes of the biosphere reserves are starting to get uh, tangled with, obviously, uh, social uh, economic conflicts. And um, so having an adaptation program helps you uh, identify and prioritize uh, those different threats in time to, to tackle them. And this is a case 
in Mexico, in Mexico we have the opportunity, the first subsidy in climate change adaptation for uh, areas. And fortunately enough, we had the adaptation program before, beforehand. So we knew, knew exactly where to put the money and when to put it. This is a case of exactly biotech research at UNFO, where one of the activities was exactly a forum with, uh, with coffee producers in order to handle that, 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 that set that was coming to the, to the forefront of biotech research, among many other restoration activities that we have in that biotech research. Uh, in the other hand, and almost finally, uh, now that we have this general framework of how to work in Mexico uh, around climate change and protected areas, uh, we got approved an uh, 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 important project, a GF project, through a new MDP called Threaten Management Effectiveness and Resilience of Protected Areas to Save our Bodies Be Threatened by Climate Change with several partners the Forestry Commission in Mexico, the Biodiversity Commission in Mexico, some NGOs, uh, some important NGOs, and obviously the Ministry of the Environment in, 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 our, in our country. And for that, we started an analysis. Uh, there's very little money, there's a lot of work to be done, so we have to rank where we work and how we work. And for that, what we did was we divided, identified the areas and ranked them uh, for each terrestrial ecoregion and marine coastal ecoregion in Mexico to start putting our pesos uh, where they need to be. Uh, so we have a, a list of 12 protected areas that will be uh, benefited by this GF project, but uh, obviously the analysis was done for the entire system, the 174 protected areas in Mexico. So we now what's number two, what's number three, and then we can uh, shine up our, our resources in time and uh, in a more strategic way. Obviously, bearing in mind the first map that I, I, I showed you, uh, where we identify corridors and connectors between these protected areas. So the efforts are, uh, are, are there, and uh, we're working uh, towards them. Finally, uh, a very important lesson that we uh, had in the last uh, year or so was uh, a national alliance called Mexico uh, Resiliente, uh, Mexico Resilient, uh, areas, uh, its natural solutions to climate change. That's the title of the lights. And fortunately enough, we had a very big uh, answer from uh, many stakeholders, from NGOs, to, uh, uh, academic institutions, governments, and uh, with uh, bilateral cooperation, uh, like GI said, that is working very tightly with us in Mexico. That alliance now has been recognized as one um, as a uh, uh, consult uh, uh, working group to the inter intersectorial, uh, interministerial, sorry, Commission for Climate Change in Mexico. So we're affecting now or contributing to public policy directly in Mexico. As you know, this year was decreed a uh, new legislation of climate change in Mexico, which recognizes this uh, inter interministerial committee and its working groups. But now, through an alliance, you can uh, affect public policy together in collaboration, coordination with all the peers and other, and other, and other um, stakeholders in various in Mexico. So broadly, that's what we're doing in Mexico. We are identifying the spatial units, doing adaptation programs to them, uh, uh, ranking the strategy, the adaptation strategies in order to uh, channel our resources in a more uh, strategic and commercial way. And obviously, through coordination like this alliance, we're starting to bring together more resources in Mexico in order to tangle climate change in areas. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, we'll, we'll look forward to uh, the results from uh, your program. Uh, <laughs> okay, our next presentation uh, is Ken. Um, we're going to take a look at a uh, continental approach to uh, 
uh, the implementation of natural solutions. Uh, the presenters will be Lee Williams from the uh, U.S. National Park Service and Karen Kleinside from Parks Canada. to mainstream protected areas into climate change discussions and practices. But in order to do that, you also need to mainstream uh, climate change into our operations. And so as we work to define and elevate the role of protected areas in mitigating and adapting to climate change, those of us in protected area organizations have the task of demonstrating to managers on the ground why it's important for them to consider climate change at all. So we have to begin to help them understand that and to develop the tools to achieve these broad goals of biodiversity, ecological resilience, connectivity, and ultimately uh, resource protection. So Karen and I are going to tag team and show some examples uh, that help to illustrate both this top-down view of mainstream protected areas into the broader climate change discussions, as well as a bottom-up work of operationalizing climate change into planning and decision making. Um, in North America, we have a memorandum of understanding um, through the North American Committee for Wilderness and Protected Area Conservation. Um, we have some pamphlets in the back. Uh, National Park Service Director Jarvis is going to uh, talk about this a little bit more at 2.30 uh, in the Protected Planet Pavilion and uh, talk a little bit more about the brochure that this comes from. But basically, the committee has identified uh, six roles for wilderness and protected areas that uh, natural, uh, natural protected areas can provide. Conserving biodiversity, protecting ecosystem services, connecting landscapes, capturing and storing carbon, building knowledge and understanding, and inspiring people. So what are the best practices that are fundamental to supporting and elevating those roles? Um, the actions that we come together with and implement uh, have to take place within our own programs and jurisdictions. They have to take place with partners and stakeholders across jurisdictional boundaries, both continentally and internationally. So I'm going to talk a little bit about more on the first two bullets and give a very specific example. Um, and then Karen's going to talk a little bit more about the broader scale. So from uh, our perspective in the National Park Service, one of the main best practices that we're emphasizing is this idea of adaptation planning. And what you see here are sort of the key elements of our adaptation planning framework. It's kind of a simplified version that um, initially uh, you need to know what issue you're trying to address and then assess what science you have available and synthesize that into something that uh, non-scientists and managers and decision makers can understand. You also have to have an element of exploring plausible futures. Sometimes this is projections of climate change, but we do a lot of work uh, in the National Park Service on scenario planning, generally using the science-based predictions and models in a participatory process that starts to bring that into uh, making that real for decision makers. And then, of course, ultimately, bringing that information into your plans, identifying options, implementing actions. And the arrow you see across the top is to demonstrate that this has to be an ongoing and iterative process. Um, adaptation planning, vulnerability assessments, and area planning, all these tools that we're developing uh, are not a one-shot deal. There are things that are going to have to be revised as we learn more. Um, so the case study that I want to talk about um, and where we've applied this adaptation planning framework is uh, Assateague Island. So the island is um, managed by, this is of the northeast coast, it's a barrier island in North America. It's managed by the National Park Service, the Fish and Wildlife Service, and also state parks. And we have a number of, of issues that the island faces as sea level rise occurs and storm frequency and intensity change, uh, precipitation changes, so the island provides habitat for threatened species, but it also deals quite a bit with um, just 
normal processes, storms causing breaching and overwash, but also manipulation by humans in the environment are affecting the sediment supply, in particular manipulations that happen in the north of the park that cause sediment starvation on the island. So they've got climate change on top of a lot of other issues that are putting them right at that threshold. So what we did with the park is to go in and, and work with them uh, uh, getting the right science available, but also then thinking about what are the key drivers of change that are going to affect your future. And the key drivers that they identify have to do with sea level rise, changes in storm intensity, changes in uh, temperature and uh, precipitation events. And then we walk those drivers into what does this mean for you and how you manage your park? What are the impacts that you uh, are facing? Um, and Obviously, they're seeing changes in the physical landscape. Uh, they're seeing changes potentially to habitat diversity, geographical shifts of species, uh, degradation of water quality. Uh, freshwater availability was something that they hadn't really thought about that much until we did scenario planning. Um, this is something that they're starting to monitor now. So after doing the scenario planning with the park, uh, we looked at what actions are feasible under different plausible futures, and then got them to look across different futures and sort of categorize different types of actions. And they generally fall within these four areas that I've identified here. Resiliency actions, things that they can do to increase the ability of the system to take in change and be able to still maintain its characteristics. Um, obviously, research and study, there's always more information that you need. Um, they identified quite a number of things that they need to monitor, and as I said, some of them they hadn't really thought about before, like uh, fresh water supply, it's kind of a new one. Um, and then a lot of capacity building uh, activities came to the forefront through this exercise, and the need to collaborate uh, more, and the need to engage with the public and to talk about these issues and to talk about climate change with the public. So just um, some of the actions that they've now taken as a result of this have to do with setting their infrastructure back from the vulnerable areas, um, looking at mobile structures, infrastructure like bathhouses and things that visitors use so that they can remove them before a storm. So really looking at more flexible mobile infrastructure. And then one of the things I thought was really interesting, they, there's a parking lot that uh, people like to have to have access to the the beach that they, people still want to have that lot there, but what they're doing now is, is making it out of native materials and recyclable materials, uh, like shells, things that when the storm comes along and moves it back into the surf zone, they're not putting asphalt in the surf zone. So some of these seem like kind of the brighter activities, but they hadn't thought necessarily about all of them as well. They started looking at how to do the future. And I think with that, we're going to move on to Karen. Thanks, Lee. I'm just going to follow on from what you said about the, um, the need, of course, if we're going to deliver on the concept of natural solutions, that we do at the same time need to operationalize climate change within our, our programs. We need to recognize that our, our tech areas will be um, affected by climate change and deal with it. And in Canada, as in the US, our Canadian tech areas agencies are dealing with um, operationalizing climate change. Ways. As is the case of uh, the North American example that we mentioned, where we're working um, in Mexico, Canada, and the United States to collaborate around an issue. In Canada, protected areas agencies are also taking advantage of the fact that they have a structure for working together to figure out how we can collaborate on identifying the ways in which we can mainstream protected areas into our broader climate change responses. Um, that's what I'm going to talk a little bit about here. Parks Canada is a member of the Canadian Parks Council, which is the major federal, provincial, territorial um, organization for collaborating on issues associated with protected areas. And in part, we have view to encouraging mainstream, a working group of the Parks Council um, has developed really a framework for collaborating around the issue. Um, it identifies, amongst other things, of course, the need to um, collaborate on land use planning and and, uh, and bring protected areas in, into the, the planning current structure and, and look at um, climate change as one of those issues. But also really importantly, um, the group recognizes that sharing our messages, our ideas, communicating consistently, uh, learning from each other 
about um, how we're approaching climate change is probably the greatest value added of collaborating across jurisdictions, whether that be nationally or internationally. Um, and really, the, the, as is the case in the, in the North American collaboration in Canada, that's, that's the greatest benefit that we're starting to see from working collaboratively. It's understanding, that, um, working on the same basis of understanding about how our protected area systems contribute to climate change adaptation and mitigation. So what are we doing? As I mentioned, you know, we are certainly um, different jurisdictions are in various stages, and in some cases we're we're still at fairly early stages, I think, relative to Colombia and Mexico and, and the United States in terms of how we are explicitly address, addressing climate change. At the same time, we're sharing with each other our knowledge and understanding of the ways in which when we protect ecosystems, for example, we are providing solutions for people um, to adapt and mitigate climate change. The iconic Banff National Park, for example, protects the Bull River watershed, which supplies water to 1.2 million Canadians in southern Alberta, which is a very drought prone region. We're sharing this information with each other. We also understand that um, many of our protected areas sequester carbon um, and provide other important ecosystem services, as has been discussed by the other presenters. But Canadians don't actually know this. They don't